I'm excited to bring this message this morning. This year is the year of Deutimus, where we have been strengthening the foundations of our faith, fortifying our faith. You can put, there, there we go, they already have it up there. So you can see what we have intentionally been investing into you to fortify your faith this year. If there is messages that you have missed this year, I want to challenge and encourage you this morning, go back and listen. If you've just listened one time, go back and listen again because this year is about fortifying your faith because of what is to come. There is a rumbling happening in the earth, the signs, the sounds of labor in the earth of what's taking place, and there will be a continual attack on Christians, on your faith, and the body of Christ. So strategically this year, we prayed into how to fortify your faith. This morning is one of those messages, and I am teaching on strengthening the foundations of our faith on hell and judgment. You guys excited for a sermon on hell and judgment this morning? <laughs> I went to pray last night and I stepped over the threshold of my, of my doors. I went to go for a run and pray for you. And Landon has been saying to me with also uh, him preaching on joy-based warfare. And he said, preach tomorrow with joy. And I, he, he's in my head. And I go to step out, and I'm like, I'm preaching on hell and judgment tomorrow. I am going to have the joy of the Lord. And so I just wanted to set the atmosphere that there is joy in you as you receive this intense message on hell and judgment this morning. Amen? All right, so we're going to be in Luke chapter 16, verse 19 through 31. It is titled this, The Rich Man and Lazarus. Lazarus. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, Remember that you in your lifetime received your good things and Lazarus in like manner, bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm that has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be, may not be able and none may cross from there to us. And he said, then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them again, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, Neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Let us pray this morning. So Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are in this place. And we thank you that you are not in this, just in this place, but that you abide in us. So Holy Spirit, this morning we invite, invite you to offend our flesh. We invite you to anoint these words this morning so that truth also may abide in us. Lord, this morning we pray that you would awaken us to your truth. I pray that you would show us any deception or false doctrine that has made its way into the body of Christ and to us as sons and daughters. Would you expose it this morning? Lord, we want to be a free people with truth that rules and reign in us. So this morning we say, have your way and let your will be done. And we declare what Samuel said, Lord, Speak, your servants are listening this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said amen and amen. So this opening scripture begins to speak of this place of torment named Hades. Another word is hell. So what is hell? 
Hell is the state where those who do not have faith in Jesus Christ are sentenced to eternal suffering away or out from the presence of God. Hell simplified is this, that hell is eternal death or punishment. Hell is also known as these other names, the abyss, eternal death, eternal punishment, Hades, a place of torment, spiritual death, or the second death. This term Hades is the Greek word for hell, and it was a word that in ancient Greek literature could refer to the Greek god of the netherworld or the netherworld itself. The New Testament of this word Hades refers to death and the grave. The Greek translation of this word is actually Sheol. Sheol frequently refers to the realm of the dead. And we find this name Sheol in Proverbs 9.17 that says, Like Sheol, let us swallow them alive and whole, like those who go down from the pit. I want to pause here and just let you know that there is a lot of new age teachings making its way into Christianity and the body of Christ right now. Teachings that say that there is no hell, there is no judgment. In fact, the word obedience is of become offensive. That we, yes, are free, but that we use the word that we are to obey or what's right in God's eyes, that we say, if we say those words, then it feels condemning and heavy. It's as if because we are invited into relationship with Jesus that this means that we do not have to obey or live in righteousness. Can I tell you this morning that relationship with Jesus does not replace obedience and faithfulness to Jesus. This teaching is a demonic spirit that brings rebellion into the body of Christ, period. It is a spirit of rebellion. It is also lawlessness that deceives the body of Christ with some Christianese slang in there. I've come this morning to tell you to be wise and discerning, church. And if you cannot find it in the word of God, or if somebody is trying to manipulate or twist scripture to take certain parts of scriptures to put it together to make it say what they want to say to bring you a revelation, The Bible says when you do that, that all of the curses fall upon you of the word of God. When you take away or you add to it. So I wanted to warn you this morning that there are many false theologies that are being taught right now. That hell and judgment is not real. But there are hundreds of scriptures in the word of God about hell. Hundreds of scriptures. And nobody talked about hell more than Jesus. And I love all the new age teachers that want to go and Jesus is love and Jesus is this and like act like Jesus is a homeboy and a hippie. But just because Jesus is love does not mean Jesus is not judge. Jesus has many names. He has many forms. And, and he, uh, not only are there hundreds of scriptures, but it's wild when you go to the teachings of Jesus or the red words, how much Jesus talked about and taught on hell. So here's five things that you need to know about hell this morning. Number one, hell is real. Matthew 25, verse 31 through 46 is the parable of the sheep and the goats, and it's titled The Final Judgment. This is Jesus' words in the red, and it says this, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, saying, Lord... When did I see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to the least of these, you did not do it unto me. And these will go away into eternal punishment 
but the righteous into eternal life. Also, every scripture in Revelation on hell is Jesus talking. Revelations 21, six through eight, we see this, especially in verse eight. Let me read it. It says, but for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all the liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Jesus teaching again on the parable of the net in Matthew 13, 49. It says this to 50. So it will be at the end of the age that the angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be a weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus begins to describe a hell to Peter when he says in Matthew 16, 18, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Hell is mentioned over and over in the word of God and Jesus, our savior, our redeemer, taught and talked about hell consistently. Church, hell is real. Hell is real, it's a real place. Number two, hell is a place of extreme suffering. Revelations 20. Verse 10 describes it like this, and the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever. Matthew 24, 45 through 51 it's a parable on the faithful servant, but in verse 50, it talks about Jesus's return and it says that the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In that place, there will be a weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hell is a place of ultimate suffering. You read scriptures all throughout the word of God that talk about the suffering. I want to tell you this morning, if it's your first time here, or you've never been to church before, I don't want you to hear about a mean, mad God. But I do want you to hear that there is a true place named hell that has eternal suffering that cannot be quenched which is my third point. Not only is there an extreme suffering, but hell is forever. Our opening scripture, Luke 16 to 26, is Abraham describing when the rich man is calling out, saying, if Lazarus could just dip his finger and just put it on my lips so that I could just get a little bit of relief. And Abraham's response in him is saying, no, you're there and we're here. And there's a great distance. There's a great chasm in between us that nobody may cross. Once you're there, you're there forever. Do you know how long forever is? It is eternal. It is never ending. I don't know if there's ever been a season in your life where you felt great suffering or a great waiting and just expecting when is this pain or when is this suffering going to end? Any women in the room that has ever been in labor and said, I'm doing this natural, especially with your first child. My first child... I was so excited. I had my birth plan. I was ready to go. Those contractions a week late, which felt like forever, already came, already felt like I've been waiting forever before the labor even began. Then the labor comes and it's 42 hours long. At about 36 hours, I said, call in the doctor. I'm gonna have more kids. I'm gonna try it all natural on the other ones, but bring me the epidural at about hour 36. Some woman raising their hand in the room. Can you imagine that type of suffering and torment forever? Here's the crazy thing is that I had the power over when I wanted relief. 
See, those that are sent into eternal suffering to hell, you no longer have the power over when you desire relief. It is the most extreme suffering you can imagine forever with no relief. My fourth point is this, is that health was, hell was created for Satan and his demons or his fallen angels. It was not created because a mean God wanted to send people there. It was created for Satan and his demons. Matthew 25, 41 says this, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. But here is the sad truth, is that many people will not choose Jesus. Jesus gave us the choice. God gives us the choice. Do we choose him and to live eternally with him or do we choose eternity in hell? And number five, the sad point is, is many people will go to hell. Matthew 7, 13 says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. I want to warn you again this morning for the false doctrines of universalism and heretical resources like the Mirror Bible. The mirror Bible is a man's opinion, scripture by scripture, of who he think God, who he thinks God is and what God is saying. I do not want to live my life according to what another man thinks God is or who he is or what he is doing. I want to live my life according to the God breathed word of God. Some of these teachings teach that everybody goes to heaven because everybody has some good in them. But we don't go to heaven for doing good things. We go to heaven because we have faith in Jesus Christ. And then our faith, which is a free gift, the gift of salvation is a free gift because Jesus already paid the highest price for us. And that when we receive that through faith, and that when we begin to walk this daily Christian walk with him, fearing the Lord, living in repentance, it begins to change how we act, how we live, how we talk. This is how, hmm, this is how we end better and stronger than how we started. So Jesus is not bad because people choose hell because they don't choose him. Second Peter 3.9 says this, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but he is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Church, repentance is key. Repentance is not just for when you get saved, although many rarely even repent when they get saved. Repentance is not just for the really big oops, whoa, totally messed up on that day. Repentance is a lifestyle. It's a walk. It's something in every daily encounter. We search our heart like David did and we begin to repent to him and to others. I wanna encourage you, if you have not listened to the message that I ministered on months ago, repentance prepares the way, please listen. If you need to refresh your memory and you have not been walking in repentance, listen again. Repentance is key to a Christian walk. So this is the question, who goes to hell? The Bible tells us in Revelations 21, 8, it says this, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire, sulfur, which is the second death. I think a lot of us, when we read this, we just feel super confident. <laughs> it's like, you know what? Didn't murder anybody in the last season. 
I don't consider myself a sorcerer. I'm doing pretty good on the majority of this scripture, but I feel like there's some gray area on a couple of these. And I'm gonna get into them today. And I believe the gray area is when it says the faithless and the idolaters. And we think because we haven't carved images for ourselves with a giant image in our house that we're not idolaters. But I'm not gonna get ahead of myself. So first I'm gonna give you some practical advice. You learned all of this about hell this morning. Be intentional about telling people about Jesus. Come on, a fear of the Lord, when you begin to talk about hell, enters the room, enters. Do you feel the fear of the Lord this morning? There are people, thousands and millions, going to eternal suffering in hell. Your job is to tell them about the free gift of salvation. Church, it's your job that everybody you come in contact with, everywhere that you go, every place you step your foot is a platform. You don't need a stage and a microphone. Everywhere you place your foot, the Lord has souls around you to tell them about the free gift of salvation to keep them from eternal suffering. I ministered a message a couple of weeks ago on Testify with Dunamis. I also encourage you to listen to this because your greatest calling in life is to be a servant of Jesus Christ. And a huge portion of that is to testify about how good he is. And I believe a lot of us are silent on this. That we are not fulfilling the Great Commission. The second piece of practical advice is this. Teach your children about hell. A lot of us love to have the conversations about heaven, a family member passes or something. We have that conversation about heaven with them. But they need to know, our children need to know about this real place called hell. I'll give you some practical, personal advice of how I do it with my children. <laughs> So one morning, we're driving on the way to school. We're supposed to be having some encounter time. And they do these uh, Bible memory verses. They're memorizing the whole armor of God and the spirit, the fruit of the Spirit and um, the, you know, what was that? Gifts of the Spirit. Thank you. And uh, after this specific day, they're now learning uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8 on what is love. Because in the car, speaking of hell, all hell breaks loose as we're memorizing scripture. They are fighting and arguing about who gets to lead what and whose turn. And no, that was my fruit that I want to pray for today. Porter's trying to break out of his car seat to rip his brother's face off. Preston is on the other side pointing his finger, laughing in mockery at him because he can't get to him. And it is just wild in my car right now. And I just drop like the mom preacher mode like, oh yeah, it's happening right now. There's a cancelization of memorizing scripture and I'm giving them the hell speech right now. <laughs> and like with the fear of mom and the fear of God, I just start telling them all about this place, hell. And I'm telling you, it gets quieter in my car than it's ever been ever since I've had children in this moment. Like you could hear anything drop at this moment. And then I hear Preston <laughs> when I finally take a pause. He says, mom... Am I going to hell? <laughs> I sure hope not, Preston. <laughs> Church, we have, to, we have to teach our kids about this place, hell. They have to be aware that where we are living right now, it is not the final destination. That there is an eternity that is connected to our faith in this place that's on the line. The Bible says that tomorrow is promised to nobody. And so I encourage you this morning to not just teach uh, your children about heaven, but to also teach them about this place called hell. Another name for hell is this word, Gehana. Gehana means this, a place of judgment. And they named it this because it was a place that was believed to have been cursed because it was the location of child sacrifice. We see this in Jeremiah chapter 7 and 19. So what does this word judgment 
mean? This word judgment in the Greek is this word, the kia I did it. The kia This word is broken up into two other words. It's the kios and krisis. The kios means this, righteous or right in God's eyes. This is so important that you know the definition of righteousness. That is not what we think is right. It's what's right in God's eyes. And then this word krisis is a decision or judgment. When you put them two together, it makes the word righteous judgment, which, mean, which means this, a just judging or a just judgment or judgment based on God's standard or his own justice. We see this word used in Romans 2 verse 5 that says this, but because of your hard heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. I don't know if you've noticed, but there's been a chant for about the next decade that I believe even Christians utilize all the time, and it's this. Don't judge me. You're chuckling because either you use it, your teenagers use it on you, you use it on your parents. We hear it everywhere. Is don't judge me. And because we have heard this so often, don't judge me, a theology or a false truth, which, which is a lie, has crept into Christians that we are not supposed to judge. I'm about to flip your theology upside down for a second. Because this begins, when people begin to declare, don't judge me, it's because they are offended with obedience, which is a biblical value. A people that do not want to obey God, his word, nor his teachers respond, don't judge me. Offense with obedience is a giant step into deconstructing the word of God or making the word of God serve you and your flesh. That leads us into not believing in judgment or hell. Why? Those that do not want to obey do not want consequences. This is why it's rebellion. But can I tell you, church, no matter how we want to form it, no matter how we want to cut and paste the word of God, we do not have the power to remove consequences from disobedience. Even in this earth, when we disobey, there are consequences even under grace and mercy. And so this is why this theology is so detrimental to the body of Christ because we feel all warm and fuzzy and that this is the love of Christ, that there would be, yeah, no obedience and I'm offended with it so that what? I don't have to have consequences or what? Now I begin to remove an eternal consequence that is real. And so we have a bunch of Christians going around encouraging other people to live their life however you want to live. We have some popular preachers with a lot of followers on social media that want to do some salvation altar calls and say, you just have to say this little prayer. But it doesn't matter how you live because you said a one time prayer now you can go live however you want to live what they're saying is you can begin you can still continue to serve your flesh but spend eternity in heaven Woo. this is destructive this is a false teaching Judgment is real, and judgment is what's coming before either an eternal blessing or consequence. Four things that you need to know about this word judgment. One, 
Jesus is the judge. So those same new age teachings all about Jesus and just me and Jesus. Remember what I opened up with. I got ahead of myself earlier when I said it. Yes, Jesus is love, but Jesus is judge. And we find it in John 5, 21 through 30. It says this. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Verse 24, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears, come on, say, hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming. This is Jesus's words. And it is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those say, who hear? Come on, with passion, who hear? will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. Listen to this, verse 27. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. For an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. And then Jesus closes with this. And he says in verse 30, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Church, Jesus is the judge. And we will all go before him one day. And we will not get to defend ourselves and all the things and all the false theologies and all the opinions of what we had of him if we never honored him as judge in our life. And a generation that continues to declare, don't judge me, is literally rejecting an identity of Christ that will never be prepared for a judgment seat. Number two, I'm just gonna about to wreck your world a little bit more here. We should judge one another as believers. You're like, wait, what? I thought we weren't supposed to judge each other. No, I'm about to show you in the word of God. We should judge one another as believers. 1 Corinthians 5, 12 through 13 says, for what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church who we're supposed to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. The word of God says that we are called not to judge those outside. We're called to judge those inside. So just look around you for a second. You're supposed to judge them. And here's the beautiful thing. You want to know what judging means? Making a decision between right and wrong. How we judge one another is how iron sharpens iron. Can you imagine instead of saying, don't judge me, can you imagine telling your circle around you, I would like to invite you to judge me. I would like accountability. I would like you to judge my actions Monday through Friday, not to just make me feel good on Sunday, but I want to invite you in close to begin to help me, to prepare me to go before the king one day. Can you imagine a generation? Can you imagine a church that would rise up, that would set our flesh in the place it's supposed to be, crucified, carrying our cross, how we may be prepared just potentially for that judgment seat one day? Come on, invite somebody. Invite multiple people into your life and say, judge me. And then you, when you approach others, judge them gently like the word of God says, but you have that lean in and so many Christians have the lean in and they say, no, I don't want to judge you, but no lean in. Every day, church, you know you make judgments 
when you're parenting, when I'm looking at my children manifesting, I make a judgment between right and wrong and then they get a consequence for choosing wrong. It's placing a judgment. Those that are watching what's happening in Israel right now, we have made a judgment between right and wrong and that the spirit of Haman that is alive in 2023 and trying to wipe out the Israelites, uh, Israelites again, that it is wrong. We make judgments every day. We are supposed to make judgments because it is consistently creating this fleshly being to be on the side of what is right in God's eyes. So I want to read you this scripture because it says in Galatians 6.1, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. It says what? Restore him. The point of judging somebody is to restore them. The point of somebody judging you is for them to help restore you or that broken place that they're speaking into. This is why Matthew 7, 5 also says, first take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Notice it does not say, don't take the speck out of your brother's eye. It just says, take it out of yours first so what? I can see clearly so that I'm not walking in deception, trying to help friends in their deception, all of us on a road to deception. Humbly remove the plank out of your own eye and then gently go restore people around you. The Bible tells us to judge other believers, but to judge ourselves first and to do it with the intention of restoring the other person. Number three, everyone will go before the judgment seat. We see this in 2 Corinthians 5, 9 through 10. It says, so whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So we will all go before the judgment seat of Christ but what I want to point out here, it says, so that each one may receive what is due for them. It's interesting because I think a, a lot of us, when those types of messages are preached, it's, but Pastor Heather, I thought that we were saved through faith. Why does it keep saying that we're going to be judged based on what we did? Let's go to the Word of God. Romans 2, 5 through 10. This is the scripture that I opened up earlier speaking of God's righteous judgment. But if we continue to read, it says this in verse six. He will render to each one according to his works. Verse eight, but for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil. So it says that we're to be judged by our works. Galatians 3, 1 through 9 does say that we are saved by hearing with faith. It says it in verse 2. And it says that we are saved because we heard and we believed. And then it says in verse 6, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. So yes, church, we are saved by faith in Jesus. Salvation is a free gift, but our works and our deeds prove our faith. This word that you've been repeating all morning when it says that they will hear and believe, it is the Greek word akuo. And it does not mean like when your spouse tells you to go pick up your dirty laundry and you hear them, but you don't hear them because you don't want to hear them. It's not that kind of a hear. 
This word here means this, to hear God's voice, which prompts him to birth faith within. This is why over and over it says that you are saved by hearing because this type of hearing is not just something that you hear, but all of a sudden there's a personal reformation that takes place where the crooked ways are made straight and faith begins to rise in you and what you once looked at, what you once set your eyes on, what you once had faith in, no longer is what your faith is in because your eyes like you worshiped and sang this morning has been shifted to Jesus. So Abraham did not just hear the word of the Lord, but he heard. And can you imagine the reformation that had to took place? When his promise, he waited for his entire life. And now God says, go sacrifice him. He didn't just hear. He heard that produced a faith that said, I trust my God so much. He can ask for my most prized possession. He can ask for the thing that I have cried out for my entire life. He can ask for my purpose. He can ask for everything in my life. And I trust him. I have such a faith in him. I will take every step on that mountain with my son, ready to follow through and obey. See, faith is not stagnant there's action we find it in James 2 14 through 26 and it's titled faith and works and it says this what good is it my brothers if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds can such faith save him Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you tells him, go in peace, stay warm and well fed, but does not provide for his physical needs, what good is that? So too faith by itself, if it does not result in action, in deeds, in works, is dead. So he says this in verse 18, show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith with deeds. Because he said there's a difference. And then in verse 19, he drops the mic. You believe that God is one. Good for you. Even the demons believe that and they shudder. A lot of Christians have been walking around Oh, I believe in Jesus. I believe in, oh good, you believe in him? You're good then. It's not what the word of God says. A true belief and faith in Jesus shifts everything. It changes everything. It comes with the spirit of Jesus, a Holy Spirit that begins to wholly convict us that begins to transform and confront things in us that used to be, that can no longer be within because we have become one with the Holy Spirit. So I want to ask you this question this morning. What separates you from the demons believing in him also? Do your actions set you apart from demons? Or do you just believe? Demons don't obey him. Actually, there was sometimes they did. Just had an epiphany. Many Christians obey him less than demons did. And this is why these false theologies are taking so quickly. That we are so offended with obedience because if demons shudder in his presence and we can walk up to an altar man 30 minutes of worship it's a long time 45 minutes 
I guess I could just use this time to go over my to-dos this week and how to become more successful in the things that I'm doing. This is an American Christianity doesn't want suffering, that wants to deny a holy king, that wants to make us holy like him. Can I tell you this morning what separates you from demons believing in him, being intimate with him? Your daily encounters are everything because those that are intimate with him are near him and hear him. I want to encourage you this morning, if you are not yet daily encountering, you're going to hear it every week and you're going to hear it over and over because there's no other answer. There's no other seven steps to success that's going to bring you joy on this earth and eternity. It's daily encounters with him. It's, it's in this place that the Spirit of God begins to offend our flesh that we would, so that we would stop serving ourselves and begin to serve him. I believe the greatest idol of the American church and of America is the idol of self. Landon preached on the three false gods of America a couple of weeks ago. And this morning I came to tell you, the church is obsessed with the idol of self. We have served self by self-promotions, self-made, self-help, books, steps, podcasts. It's a thing girls say all the time about making sure they're healthy and they have time for me. Self-care has nothing to do with the Spirit of God. So that what, I'm going to be a stronger, healthier person by getting my nails done? No, but really, we say these things, and they have so made its way into our belief systems to be healthy Christians, and they all have self in front of them because we are idolizing self. Go with me to this scripture, 1 Peter 4, 17 through 19. It says this, For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And then it says in verse 18, And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? I thought I had my top three of like fear of the Lord scriptures. This just made its way in. I'm going to repeat it just in case you were falling asleep there. What will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. I spent years ministering on a scripture in the Old Testament that is very similar to this portion of scripture. It's where the marked message for marked conference came from. Yes, Revelation talks about and times about how Satan is going to come to mark his followers and Christ is going to mark a remnant that he is going to come and save. But Ezekiel chapter 9 is a foreshadow of this time and it's titled this, The Slaughter or Judgment of the Idolaters. And literally because of the idolization that was taking place in this city, in Jerusalem, because the injustice was so great in this city, the Bible says that God brings great judgment. He sends a death angel to the city and he says, just go ahead and mark the ones that cry and lament over their sins, nations. This is wild because it didn't say the ones that do the best this or the ones that quote the most scripture, the ones that do the most great deeds. It literally says, go and set apart or make distinct 
redeemed, those that have cried out and lamented for their sins, nations. What is this? It's a sound of repentance. Those that were living a life of repentance were the ones that were marked and set apart. Everybody else was destroyed. And in this portion of scripture, I believe it's in verse six, it says this, also makes the top three. Kill old men outright, young men and maidens, little children and women, but touch no one whom has the mark and begin at my sanctuary. He says, bring judgment to the house of God first. My fourth point is church judgment is coming to the house of the Lord first. The place that we think we are safe in his sanctuary, which is what it means. Can I tell you this morning that nobody sitting around you, my faith, me laying hands on you, you being a member of this church does not get you into heaven. He is coming to judge each one of us according to our faith and our faith that produces deeds. He is coming to judge in the body of Christ first. Why? The Bible says in this portion of scripture that the reason why he brought this level of judgment was because the injustice was so great in the city. I just want to lean in for a second real quick. Because I believe that God has entrusted this house with great vision for the realms of injustice, which means it is very easy for you to be a man or a woman of Jesus' justice or heaven's justice. It is very easy for you to get involved with what the Lord wants to do in the earth through justice. And if God annihilated cities because injustice was great and the house of the Lord was silent, do you think maybe it's going to be one of those things that the seed of judgment that you have to face, were you a man or a woman of justice? Or did you just pass by that homeless man every single day? Oh no, he's a drug addict. I'd rather go spend these dollars at Starbucks, a company that gives all their millions to abortion and murders babies. That's a better place than that homeless man. Don't you know all the things that I'm trying to do, all the things that I'm trying to build, and they just keep sending me all these requests to serve in children's, serve at the food bank, and you know, go run at Justice Run, and go get involved with my city council. What is for liberty and justice? They're telling me to get involved. All Don't they know how busy I am? Oh, we have served self. It is the idol that we have brought into our encounters with the Lord. And said, I don't know why he's not answering me. I don't know why I'm not encountering them like, like you know, him, like they say that they're encountering him. Oh, because we have our trophy idol of self. In fact, in our opening scripture, was the rich man in Luke 16. Go ahead and put it up. And in the opening verse, notice it just begins to describe this rich man and how he dressed and how he ate. This is not sin. Many people get this portion of scripture mixed up. They think that it means like it's virtuous to be poor and that it's sin to be rich. This is not true. Notice that it doesn't say that this man was our top sins. Oh, he was sexually immoral. He was a liar. He was a thief. He was a wicked man that turned his back on God. It doesn't say that. All it says is that every single day when he drove up to his gates, there was a man named Lazarus with sores that was poor. And the only thing we know about this man other than he was rich is that he passed by in 
injustice every single day. He drove by day after day. Maybe some days in mockery, some days shh, go get a job. Shh, what are you doing out here? What, what sins did you commit to be here? What does he have to be at my gate? He had mercy moments every day to not serve self. The rich man was sentenced to hell because he served the idol of self. It was about him and what he had done and he had built. That literally the idol of self became so large that he couldn't see a man at need at his own gate every single day. Worship team, come up on the platform. This morning, I am leaning in all the way. I am leaning in all of the way because we want to say things like, I don't have to go to church because I am the church, but I haven't seen the church really rise up to be the church yet. So if you're the church and you don't need church, why does the world look like that? We are obsessed with self. And many of you this morning have not realized until this moment that you are like this rich man. So busy doing thanks that you have passed injustice. You have been serving self and not people in Jesus. In this portion of scripture, the rich man begins to cry out to Abraham. And if you just read it, you think Abraham is a bit harsh. But Abraham can only repeat the word of God back. And this man begins to cry out for a dead man to come back to be a sign to his brothers. And he says, if only they had this sign. He begins to cry out to Father Abraham for a sign. I want to teach you something in scripture real quick. Jesus says, Matthew 12, 38 through 42. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. This man in hell begins to cry out for a sign. Holy Spirit, come. Glory of God, conviction of God, come. Condemnation, go. Holy King, come. And woo your people today. The spirit of mammon will tell you if you just had this one thing, then you could do this for God. If you just had this answered prayer, then your family would be okay and you would be strong and then you would be ready to go. If you just had this amount of money, then you would have enough to go birth and do that thing. You would have enough to give to this. You would have more time to be able to, th to do this. If I just had this thing, this is what the rich man begins to say to Abraham. If you would just send a sign in spirit of mammon fashion and Abraham sees right through it and he says, no, you've already been sent signs and they haven't wanted to listen to Moses and the prophets let them listen let them hear it's interesting that in this portion 
portion of scripture, Jesus uses the name Lazarus because Lazarus was a friend of his. Lazarus was a dead man in scripture. Lazarus was buried and it says that Jesus on the third day gets to the town and says, rise Lazarus, come out of the grave. And all of a sudden in this parable, he uses this man, Lazarus, as a sign. Abraham says, no, the signs have been sent and you haven't paid attention. And then not just does it only stop with Lazarus, but the greatest sign the world has ever seen. Jesus Christ gave himself up on a cross. He was sacrificed for you and I. He gave his all. He gave his everything to serve us so that we could choose him. He paid the price so that we can live freely in eternity with him. This is why Jesus says only an, uh, an evil generation would begin to ask for just one more sign. And if I just had this one more thing and Abraham knows and says to him, no, that won't change anything. And many of you this morning, you have been deceived. You have been deceived by different demonic spirits or this idol of self, of serving self. What do I need to be able to accomplish these things? And this this morning I wanted to encourage you that this idol of self must be shattered otherwise you are walking in deception it can never fully truly serve Jesus so this is what I want you to do I want you to close your eyes this morning can I tell you this morning Jesus is enough Whatever those things are that have been weighing you down, that have had your eyes on it instead of Jesus. Jesus is enough. He always has been and he always will be. Church, stop operating in your own strength and your own power. It's because you desire credit so badly. Oh, when you let go of it and you let him lead you. it'll be so easy and so light. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would come. You would move on your people right now.